page 111. And by the way, if you found it on a different page or I'm off by a page or two, just let me know. So on 111, per federal law, a unit or a credit hour represents 50 minutes or one hour, we round it up, of classroom or direct faculty instruction and a minimum of two hours out of class uh, work for each week. So uh, for each week of the 15 weeks of instruction, which is the semester length. So this includes laboratory work, internships, etc. So basically, if you're in a three unit lecture course, it would be three hours of lecture every week for that class and a total of six hours out of class for, uh, of work per week. Now, that being said, that's what is the, that's what federal law says. The university recommends three hours of studying for each unit that you're enrolled in, not just the two hours. So the studying includes notes, reading, group meetings, and research. So, to kind of break it down. So a three unit class equals about three hours of instruction per week. 15 units will equal 15 hours of instruction per week. So SDSU recommends three hours of study time per week for each unit you're enrolled in. So if we take the 15 units and we multiply that by three hours of study time, this equals, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> um, so 45 hours, and then we take the 15 hours of instruction, okay, sorry. So we take the 15 hours of instruction plus the 45 hours of study time, and that gets us to 60 hours of schoolwork per week. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So this, I'll tell you, so I also do the presentations for, um, for each uh, orientation group. And I go through this for our freshmen and our transfer class, and it scares them, right? Because it's pretty overwhelming when you look at it like this. So what we're saying is to be a successful student, we're expecting students to put in about 60 hours of schoolwork per week. Okay. So that is more than a full-time job, right? And we want students to be as informed as possible about this rule of thumb. So we want them to be planning. If they're in 15 units, they should be planning their schedule so that they have about 45 hours for the outside activities. Any questions on that? Okay. Do we feel like we need a break or do you want to keep going through the terms? Keep going. Keep going? Great. So next we're going to talk about lower division and upper division courses. So lower division courses, this is found on page 111. These are courses numbered 100 through 299. These are usually taken during freshman and sophomore years. Upper division courses are also on page 111. These are courses numbered 300 through 599, usually taken junior and senior years. Courses numbered 500 through 599 are both upper division courses and they're acceptable for advanced degrees. Okay. So later when I ask you about upper division courses, I'm looking for, for 300 through 599. Uh, and spoiler alert, when I say something like that, that means it's gonna be on a quiz. So just throwing this out there. All right, any questions on that? Okay. Yes. Can you oh. explain the, um, they're also upper division classes and graduates? Yeah, so when students hear the word upper division, most students think 300 through 499. Because as undergraduate students, when you're in your upper division, you're usually taking classes that are 300 and 400. Yeah. Classes that are numbered 500 through 599, are also upper division. So they are potentially classes that you could be taking as an undergraduate, but they're also acceptable for advanced degrees. So there are graduate students that may be also taking those 500 level courses. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions on that? Okay. So first we're gonna talk
talk about student classification. So this refers to how students are classified. This is on page 477. So we classify students into being uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Classification is based on units, not based on year in school. So a freshman could come to orientation, and they're a freshman because it's their first year. However, let's say they came in with 35 credits of AP. This is not unheard of. So what would their classification be? Sophomore. They'd be a sophomore, that's right. So even though they're in their first year, they're technically a sophomore based on the amount of credits that they came in with. Does that make sense? Okay. So a freshman is a student that has earned a total of fewer than 30 semester units. A sophomore is a student that has earned 30 to 89 <coughs> semester units. A junior is a student that has earned a total of 60 to 89 semester units. And a senior has earned 90 semester units and more. So a student is considered to be an upper division standing when they have earned 60 units or more. So this is different than upper division major, but we'll talk about that. <coughs> the next term is full-time status. That's also on page 477. So full-time means the student is enrolled in at least 12 units per semester. The university, however, recommends 15 units every semester in order to graduate in a timely manner. Okay. Prerequisite is on page 112. A prerequisite is what you have to complete before being able to take another course. So students must satisfy course prerequisites or the equivalent prior to taking a course. Faculty do have the authority to enforce the course prerequisites that are listed in the catalog and, on, and online on the class schedule. And faculty also have the authority to evaluate what's considered an equivalent, so an equivalent preparation. So maybe it's not a direct equivalent, but the faculty have the authority to look at that course and determine if it's in fact going to work as the prerequisite. Okay. So let's take as an example, Let's say a student wants to take a course that requires Biology 100 as a prerequisite. So Biology 100 is a general biology course. If the student has never taken Biology 100, but they took a similar course that allowed them to attain comparable knowledge, a professor could say that the similar course is the equivalent preparation, in that in turn they've met the prerequisite for the course. Faculty may require proof that the prerequisite has been completed, so they may need to see a transcript or they may need to see the degree evaluation. And if the student does not meet the prerequisite, this came up earlier, but signs up for the class anyway, they may be dropped from the course by the instructor. The other thing that we kind of want to you know, touch base with students on, yes, they may be dropped from the course. They may also not be dropped from the course. So it's not the instructor's responsibility to drop the student from the course if they do not meet the prerequisite. So if for some reason the student is allowed to stay in the course, they're then responsible for that break. Okay? And so it's important to emphasize with students that prerequisites are not something we just arbitrarily make up. Okay? We're not trying to make students jump through hoops just for the fun of it. Prerequisites are there because faculty has told us that if the student doesn't have this more foundational level of knowledge, they are not statistically proven, they're not going to be successful in this more advanced course. Yes? How often will it happen that a student gets into a class and they don't have the prerequisite and it doesn't kick them out? So a student can get into a class even without the prerequisite if the class doesn't have that enforced computer prerequisite checking. So for example, if a student chooses a course they do not have the prerequisite for, they could get a warrant that says, hey, you don't have the prerequisite to this course. You could potentially get removed from this course. And so they go to the class anyway. I think a, a, I don't know the exact percentage. I, I want to say it's very high. But most of the time, the instructor will say, if you don't have a prerequisite, you, 
need to drop the course or you will be dropped from the course. But in the event that doesn't happen and the student somehow gets past the add drop deadline without ever speaking to the professor about that lack of prerequisite, it could turn out to be um, bad news for the student because it could turn out that they get a failing grade and then they're responsible for that grade. Does that answer your question? Any other questions on that? Okay. Uh, I was going to say, from my experience, that your best bet is to email the professor ahead of time because they most likely know for the class. So about the prerequisite. Yeah, I mean, sometimes what you say, sometimes I recommend not to. So mm -hmm. uh, it's always good to have that communication because, like you said, if you get dropped, then there's no class to take, then you're kind of jumping through hoops trying to take another class. So yeah, better to know ahead of time and not. Cross your fingers and hope all well. <laughs> That's a great friends. point, Bill. Thank you. Um, and also, the other layer to that is, you know, wait lists. I'm sure most of you have had experience with that. Sometimes it's not a very pleasant experience for students. <laughs> and so, especially if you're on a wait list or you're dealing with um, all sorts of things, like what if you drop below 12 units or something like that. So, yeah, that's a great suggestion. If you took a class that's not the prerequisite, but it's similar, do you reach out to like the professor or do you reach out to in order to get that approved? Yeah, so like using our example, let's take let's say that you took a biology course somewhere else, like at a community college, but it wasn't our biology one hundred, then yeah, you would reach out to that professor. Now if you took a different course here, you may have a harder time getting that instructor to approve it, because let's say you took a different I don't know if I have an example because I don't want to go too far into biology, but um, let's say it's a sociology class and you took a psychology class, but you took it here. So chances are it's not going to work as a prereq because they already looked at that class. But if you took it elsewhere and you feel like it's similar, then yeah, the professor can sign off now. Yes. So like another example, I'm taking a class that I do like meet the prereqs for, mm -hmm. um, but it was like it's a sociology class and you needed 101, but I took 102. Um, so it's not like the entry level one, but it's still like an entry level sociology class. And I emailed the professor and told her that I took 102, so I at least have some like foundation in sociology. Okay. Okay. And she said like that was fine. Okay. So that's an example as well. That's perfect. Did everyone hear that example? So that was a really good example. Okay. Does that help you too? All right. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on that? Okay. So again, we always want to remember to check the prerequisites and check the schedule during the schedule adjustment period. And we want to re reiterate that to students. Okay. So let's do a little question. So which of the following is true? A, student classification is determined by the number of units a student has earned. B, minimum of 12 units is needed to be a full-time student. C, an instructor may drop you from a course for lack of prerequisite, or D, all of the above. D, D, all of the above, that's correct. So all of these are true. So the student classification is based on the number of units earned. Full time is a minimum of 12 units per semester. Uh, the instructor can drop you from the course, but remember, the student can't rely on that. So the student is responsible for their schedule. And um, coming back to that question, more often than not, if they don't get dropped from the course and the student's not attending the course, then they could get a W, U, or an F on their transcript. Okay. So let's talk about the next term, which is advanced placement. This is also referred to as AP credit. So this is on page 474 and 477. So exams of the College Board Advanced Placement Program. So this is a national exam, and we may award college credit depending on students' scores on these exams. The exams are not automatically sent to SDSU, so the student must re request their official score report to be sent to us. So the chart of awarding AP credit is on page 47, 474. So if you flip to 474, and look towards the bottom of the page as an example. We'll look at Spanish language. And let's say the student gets a score of three. So how many units would they get? Six units. 